Here we go, going live. Pawn Boss Magazine. Hello, everybody. Bob Lusk, editor of Pawn Boss Magazine and Fisheries Biologist. Glad you guys are joining me tonight. Holy cow, it's been a really hectic day today. Uh, <laughs> that, kind of surprised we weren't able to get on last week. Facebook was down. Well, you know, how does that work? Just perfect timing for them to be down while we wanted to do our broadcast. And today, Debbie was down, but now she's back up. She had a little procedure on her feet. We got lots of texts and phone calls. And uh, appreciate you guys' concern and, and the thoughts and prayers that you had for Debbie. She, uh, her little old toes, she had back surgery a few years ago, eight or ten years ago. And her toes kind of started to curl. So today, they went in and straightened out half of them all on one foot. So now she can be able to walk a little bit better. But anyway, I am so glad you guys are here. I thought today would be a good time to talk about bass spawning because I've been able to watch some in the last few days and that's one of my favorite times of the year. I love spring and since today is spring, well, let's talk about it. You guys know the drill. Hey, the, 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 the March, April issue of Pond Boss is in the mail stream. We got some extras. If you guys haven't seen Pond Boss, take a look. Now, there's a bunch of you guys that know the drill. I see Chuck Brinkman doing it. Todd Austin's in, Troy Todd's in, Chuck Brinkman's, what he did is he knows how to play the game here with us. If you'll hashtag Pond Boss Magazine, put that into the comment section, click like, and share this video to your timeline right now. That makes you eligible for a drawing. Now, we haven't had a drawing in about three or four weeks, so it's time to do that. But if you'll do those three things, all three of them, then you're entered for a drawing for a Pond Boss hat, which is pretty cool. Everybody likes a Pond Boss hat. If I wore a hat, it would be a Palm Boss hat and a Palm Boss mug. So do those things for me. And, you know, I do want to open things up for questions tonight, which that's one of my favorite things to do is to tackle everybody's questions. But uh, I see Mike Cottrell, Daniel Hendrick. Good deal. Glad you guys are checking in here. But what I thought I'd talk about today, Matt Singley, I thought I'd start off. Uh, I see Leanne checking in. Good to see you checking in there, Leanne. Yep, we made it back. Got Debbie all safe and uh, cozied in there at the house. She's sitting in her easy chair with her foot propped up with ice on it and these little compression sleeves that keep blowing up and, and down so she doesn't get any blood clots. Pat Williamson from Oakwood, Texas. Hi, Pat. So what I thought I'd do today is talk about the ways that bass spawn because it's really, really fun. Uh, we were electrofishing a lake last Friday in central Texas, not far. There's Drew Hay. Hey, Drew, you got Maddie with you? Is Maddie hanging out? Maddie, is that you? Holy cow, Maddie's there with her daddy, Drew. Good to see you guys from up around Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Maddie, I'm a big fan of yours, girl. I'm so glad you're watching this with your dad. This is pretty cool. I'm so glad you're there. We were shocking this lake near Meridian, Texas, in about a four or five acre lake. Uh, water was fairly clear, a little bit turbid from recent rains, and we were just trying to evaluate the lake. Well, we're going along the dam, usually... This time of year when the water temperature is knocking on the door of 60, I think that day the water temperature was 57 or 58. That's about the time that bass are staging to spawn because they really like to start laying their eggs 60 degrees to 62 to 64 in there during phases of the full moon. Now what's really, really fun is if you time it right and you got enough clarity where you can see, the bass will be spawning and it's really fun to watch. So what what happens just before they spawn, they stay, you know, because in the wintertime and even in the summertime, bass are looking for the perfect water temperature. Well, in the wintertime, it, it may be close to the bottom because that bottom water in wintertime is warmer than the surface water. So bass go deep, you know, and all the while the females are developing their eggs, gaining weight, even though they may not be eating a lot because they're, they're gaining mass as their eggs develop and eggs are, shoot, I think 85% water or something. And so uh, as, as, as they develop their eggs and as they uh, uh, just kind of laze around, they get a little bigger, get a little heavier. And then as the water temperature starts to rise, gets into the mid-50s, low to mid-50s, then the males, some guys call them buck bass, little bitty males, you know, anywhere from that long. Uh, the biggest male I saw at this pond last week was about, oh, I think two and a half pounds. And it was, it, 
It was 18 inches long, weighed two and a half pounds. Should have weighed three and a quarter. But it's just a big, old, lanky, skinny male. There's John Funk checking in from Mid Michigan. I hope you guys are starting to thaw out, although I kind of hope you thaw out slow and don't, you know, don't get flooded like you see what's going on around Omaha and, and the Dakotas coming up. So anyway, the males will stage first, and they typically will go back to the same nest they used last year. And what's happened since they spawned last year is the nest will fill up with detritus, silt, just fine particles of junk. And those males will go in and use their fins and their tails to sweep it out. And they'll sweep it out. You can, you can see a bass nest. It looks like a crater that's about as big around as a disc on a farm implement. You know, 12, 14 inches in diameter, almost perfectly round, in gravel if they have it, in sand if they need it. Now, they don't go into real mucky areas. I've seen them spawning on top of stumps in deeper water, but they're only going to spawn in water anywhere from 18 inches to usually about four feet deep. There's Tom Davis checking in from Ohio. And what happens is the male goes in and he cleans the nest out and gets it ready. And then as the water temperature starts to rise from the mid-50s, get into the low 60s, that's when the girls are starting to ripen. Now, if you if you take if you look at a male this time of year, they're going to be pretty thin, and depending on the day you catch one, you can kind of rub your fingers. If this is his mouth, you can rub your fingers along his belly, and you'll see the white milt come out. That's the sperm that he's going to fertilize the eggs with, and you can you can actually see that. And at the same time, the eggs of the female, when you catch a good female that's just that's ready to lay her eggs. She'll be uh she'll be real robust and and her belly will be round it'll be uh, proportionate the the left side will be just like the right side and her vent will be pink or kind of slightly red and one of the ones we shocked up this last week uh, we shocked two lakes and we found the same thing in both lakes and they were about thirty miles apart uh we picked up one female and she was dripping eggs so we weighed her measured her put her right back in the water because. When those eggs, when you pick up a bass and the little bitty yellow eggs, they're a little bitty, um, not quite transparent, yellow, yellow, kind of like the yolk of a store-bought chicken egg. And their eggs are about as big around as the head of a pin. You know, like a little pin you pull out of your shirt when you buy a new shirt, those pins? Look at the head of that pin. That's about how big a, a bass egg is. Now, uh, there's Al, Al Kahuta checking in. Good to see you, Al. Um, a big female, we shocked up one lake. We shocked up a uh, about a nine and a half pound female. She'll probably lay 80 to 150,000 eggs, depending on her nutrition. If she's had good nutrition, her eggs will ripen and she'll have as many as 150,000 eggs. So how many of those need to hatch, really, to, to replace the fish that are missing from the from the from the year classes. Hey, there's uh Craig Guffin gonna get new men get minutes for his new pond this weekend. I'd be excited about that too, Craig Guffin. Craig McBride's waving, checking in. Good to see you, Craig. Craig, I want to call you in a few weeks. I got a little project I want to talk to you about. That's I'm gonna do it at my house. I think I mentioned it, but I'm getting ready to do it. So I want to talk to you. So anyway, as we're as we're shocking this four and a half acre lake. We're not picking up any bass along the dam. Usually we do. We came around the end of the dam where the spillway is. Nothing there. Nothing there. There's Danny Tolliver. I bumped into to Tanny, to Danny Tolliver the other day at the barbershop. And Connor, Connor, dude, you're checking in with your dad. I love it. I'm glad you're watching. There's Kerry Martin checking in, an aeration expert. That's cool. Fred Bingman checking in. I don't know where Fred's hanging out. Last I heard he was in Key West. And I think I'd probably be in Key West rather than Brownstown, although that's home. So anyway, we're shocking this lake. and We come around uh, the uh, the bend of the dam near the spillway or the overflow pipe. Shallow, flooded grass, recent rains. Nothing. Nothing there. Well, this lake was up about three feet from normal. The beavers had dammed up an arc around the overflow pipe, which is straight through culvert type pipe. Well, beavers had dammed it up and they'd had plenty of rain, so the water was about three feet above normal and flooded a bunch of button bush and willow trees. So we, uh, uh, and there's Joanne checking in. Good to see you, Joanne. I hadn't seen you in a while, girl. Glad you're checking in. So anyway, we come around and we start bumping the electrodes up into some of this two, two and a half foot water where the button bush is and the willow trees. 
And we didn't go 40 feet, and we, we hit a 7.5-pound bass and an 8.9-pound 8, 8 bass with that 2.5-pound male. So there were two females with that male. So here's, here's a good point for you to know. Even though the male builds the nest and he takes care of it and keeps it clean, he may spawn with more than one female. There might be three or four females that are ripe, and, 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 and when he knows they're ripe, and they come close to his nest, they might stage out 20 feet, 30 feet, 10 feet. Once they're getting it within proximity, they're giving off pheromones so they can sense that each other is there. The male will go get that female bumper in the side until she comes over to his nest. And then during the full moon, 60 degrees, like right now in Texas, bass are spawning. And in South Texas, they've already spawned once. In Central Texas, they'd already spawned once, but now they're going at it again. And what happens is when the male bumps the female, she'll spew some eggs out and then he'll wiggle and turn sideways and squirt his milt on them. And then he'll guide them right down into the bottom of that nest, that crater-like nest. The crater might be five to six inches deep, you know, in a foot, foot and a half in diameter, typically. That's about how big they are. And once she, once she expends as many eggs as she's going to, then she'll go off and feed He'll stay there with the eggs, but then there'll be another female that may come along and he'll do the same thing. And that's part of God's plan to have diversity of genetics. Because if we had one big dominant female and one big dominant male and that's all that spawned, you know, four or five years down the road, things aren't going to be clicking because the genetics won't be as clean and pure as they are now. So uh, uh, what we, we were just in the right place at the right time with that electrofishing boat when we bumped up those fish. Now, in the second lake that we did was 14 acres. The water temperature was just a little bit cooler. And we went into water two and a half to four feet deep with the electric fishing boat. And within about 30 to 40 minutes, we shocked up over 50 male bass staged up, getting ready to spawn 50 of them in a 14-acre lake. Now, we culled some of those. We took out about 15 of those that were obviously too, well, I say too small, they were real small and probably relative weight might have been 85%. So we culled some of those because we don't really want those little bitty fish. And they had some age on them. You could tell by the way that their head was shaped. They were, uh, they were bony and their eyes were a little bit buggy. So we knew that some of those fish needed to come out. But there were no females with them. So we had our depth finder on and I was real interested to see if where we could find some girls. So we kept going around the lake and started finding, trying to find the, uh, the contour where the depth is about six to seven feet. That's about as deep as we can shock. So as we were hugging the shoreline in water six to seven feet deep, we started popping those females up. And we got, I think we got eight or nine really big females in about a 30 minute period. And they looked spectacular. And I was able to show that. And matter of fact, that was one of the ones that was dripping her eggs out. So we released her. Because she, she was ready to go find a partner. Now, what will happen is sometimes more than one bass will, will one, more than one female will spawn in that nest. But one of those females or both those females might spawn in more than one nest, if that makes any sense to you. So, hey, there's Morgan Tyler checking in. Good to see you, Morgan. We're talking about spawning bass, which down there in your part of the country, you got bass spawning right now. You know, and it, it's, the, it's the full moon. If you guys get a chance to go out like right now, this time of day, and you can ease up and sneak up and, and watch the fish, it's really, really fun because you can actually see them as they're bumping each other and doing their little rituals and their little courting dance and things like that. So it's, it's a pretty fun time to do it. Now, one of the questions I get oftentimes is, is it a bad thing to sight fish during the spawn? Well, I'm going to tell you, in 99.9% .9 of the cases, no, it's not bad to do that. And let me see here. Something's going on with my computer. Looks like it's going to quit or not. Maybe it is. Okay. Uh, something happened. I don't know. Heck, all I know is how to talk about fish. So, uh, anyway, the uh, uh, point I was going to make is... And I distracted myself. Isn't that smart? <laughs> oh, oh, sight fishing, uh, bedding bass. I'll tell you this. I don't think that, that, that if you do that 
in a large body of water that's going to make any difference. Now, here's what will happen. When you catch a male bass off of a nest and he's guarding eggs and you don't release him pretty close to where the nest is, he might not be able to make it back to that nest in time for some other fish to come in and eat the eggs. Now, go back to the numbers of bass that are hatched or bass that are spawned. If, if one female can lay 100,000 eggs and there's 10 females, do the math on that. That's a million eggs. That's a lot of eggs. How many of those really need the hatch to replenish the stock? So if you've got a 10-acre pond, 10-acre lake, and you harvest 300 bass a year, nature's going to try to replace those 300 bass. That's what's going to happen. And uh, Tom Hallowell, good to see you, man. You're welcome for the information. Uh, Fred just did it. I want to remind everybody, you know, Pond Boss, $35 a year. And this is one of the things I say on most every broadcast. Debbie and I went to dinner a couple of nights ago and spent 42 bucks. I was gone the next day. This lingers for a year. <laughs> and Pond Boss is just full of nuggets. I mean, this issue is, is loaded up with some good stuff. I mean, we've got, um, how do you source a reputable fish hatchery? How do you know you're going to get the fish that you need? You know, because most of the fish hatcheries, they're going to try to sell you what they want to sell Maybe not necessarily what you want to buy. There's Tory Rhodes. Glad to see you, man. There's a uh, there's a yellow perch spawning. That's going on right now. Uh, fundamental principles when fertilizing trophy largemouth bass fisheries. Trophic cascades. Everybody needs to know that. That's pretty interesting information. Anyway, if you guys have never seen the magazine, if you want a sample copy, send us a note to info at pondboss.com and your address and just ask for a sample of the magazine and we'll send you one. There's Bev Rude. Hi, Bev. Good to see you. I bet you Lake Vilbig's looking good about right now. Uh, so now let's go back to um, the impact of spawning bass. If you go catch a female that is egg laden, one of those big bass like everybody in a tournament wants to catch like right now, like they did at the Bassmasters Classic last weekend, uh, does, does that affect the spawn? Well, when you catch a big female or even a small male, it will affect their spawn. That doesn't mean it will kill their spawn. If you catch a female that's dripping eggs, you know, first of all, she bit the hook because she was hungry. And when fish are spawning, they're not eating. Now, if you catch one on a bed, it's defending the nest. I mean, I don't know how many times I've flipped a, 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 a wacky rig worm, watermelon colored, laid in a bed and watched as the male bass picks it up, takes it outside the bed and drops it, never gets it in his mouth. You know, so if you do catch a fish not far from a nest, it's probably hungry. And if it's feeding, it's not spawning. Because when they're spawning, that's what they're focused on. You know, like during the rut, how many deer get hit on the side of the road, in the middle of the road, because they're paying attention to that rather than not getting hit. You know, so it's kind of the same principle in, with, with the fish. When they're spawning, that's pretty much what they're thinking about. Now, bluegill are a little different. You can't catch bluegills off the bed all the time because it's such a competitive spawning circumstance. If you think about it, when you've got bluegills spawning, they're spawning in colonies. You know, you may have a whole bunch of bluegills about this big, the males, guarding the nest. You know, their gills flared out. They make themselves look really big to scare the enemies away, you know. But they're in such competition, not only for space and for eggs and for females, and they're trying to defend against everything, you can catch those suckers right off of a bed because they'll come and hit something because they're aggressive. Where most of the time a bass isn't going to be aggressive unless you make it mad enough defending its nest that you'll, that you'll cause it to strike. But if you catch a female that's dripping eggs, turn her loose. She'll go right back to what she was doing. You know, it's, it's scientists have proven over the years that a bass's memory lasts about 15 minutes. You know, so, I mean, I can't tell you how many, I'll I, I never forget this story. A good friend over there at um, Button Willow Lake in, near Lone Oak, Arkansas, he sent me a picture of this, which was pretty cool. Then he called me, Doug Jackson is his name, and uh, Doug's from Little Rock. He called me, he says, man, you're not going to believe this. And he was texting me the pictures. He sent me the pictures. Well, he had two rods in his boat, and he was fighting a fish, and he looked up, and his other rod, he goes, asshole over elbows into the lake and disappears. 
So he, he, he's hooked up two times, but now he's losing a fishing pole. So about an hour and a half later, he's fishing, and he catches another bass, and he reels it in, and it's got the lure that he lost in its jaw, and he's able to pull in his rod that he just lost an hour and a half ago. So how long was that fish's memory, and it still had a lure in its mouth? You know, so bass don't have a long memory. So if you catch a female that's, that's, that you know is plump, you know, fish it. Go ahead and catch it. Turn it loose. You know, now the males, if you got a male defending a nest, then it's going to want to keep doing that. But if, you, if, you're, if you're determined to call some males, which we encourage that this time of year, call some males. Take some out. When you do, is it going to hurt the fishery? No, it's not. It's not. You know, even if even if one-tenth of one percent of those eggs hatch and grow to adulthood, that's more than enough. So don't worry about that. Let's see here. Uh, Sandra Drugosh, Matula, Vandegrift. That's a lot of names there, girl. Three days ago, I caught a small girl that had just spawned. Her tail was messed up, and she still had blood on her, blood on her side as well. Great photo of her, Neighborhood Pond. There you go. That's a perfect example. Now, here's what's going on there. When those girls start spawning, you got to remember the nests are typically gravel or rocky. And when she comes into that nest, the male's bumping her in the side. And sometimes, as a matter of fact, there was a, a, a huge bass that was caught at Lake Fork back in the 90s that was uh, taken to the Freshwater Fisheries Center, um, put it on exhibit, and a one and a half pound male killed that 16 pound, 17 pound bass, whatever she was back then. I think she was 17 pounds. And a little bitty bass killed that girl by bumping her into the side so hard. So when you catch a girl like that, that's got a bloody tail, that's been scraped on the gravel or the rocks of a, of a nest. And when she's got blood on her side, that's because she's been rammed by a, a, a male trying to convince her to come spawn with him. So that's pretty common. Let's see here. Danny Tolliver said, my son Connor would like to know how long it takes for the eggs to hatch. Seven to 14 days. That depends on the water temperature. And what happens is that male will, now listen listen to me, Connor. Are you listening, mister? boy. Those eggs, the male will bundle them up into a clump, and they're yellow. And then, like I said earlier, they're, they're the same color as a store-bought hen egg, kind of a light yellow color. And they'll be all massed together, but the male circling around and around, circulating water through them, because every one of those eggs is breathing. They've got a real porous shell, and they've got to have oxygen in order to be able to develop and so he's moving around, kicking the water through those eggs. And then when they hatch, they're called uh, sack fry. Because all you can see, if you look at them up close, they look like two little bitty black eyes, a little tail, and a big fat yellow belly. And over about a four or five day period after that, they'll absorb the yolk, turn dark, and get hungry. Now when those baby bass are first hatched, baby fish of all species, by the way, they don't have any fat stores. They don't have any energy. So they have to continually eat. So when a school of bass goes from, from um, sack fry to the next stage, that's called swim up fry. That's when you see that bundle of dark bass come up in a tight school and start moving around. And the male forces them out of the nest to do that and he pushes them up and then they go into shallow water. So if you're walking around your pond this time of year and within the next month in some guys, in some of your places, uh, and you see these little bitty dark fish that look like minnows. They're about that long. Those are probably your bass babies. Now, what's going to happen is they're going to eat anything that fits in their mouth, which includes each other. A school of 50,000 bass in a pond, you give them eight weeks, there'll be two fish left because all the rest of them got eaten, maybe by those two fish. So they're real, real aggressive. They'll feed on plankton early on and little bitty you know, amoebas and paramecium and stuff like that. And then they'll start eating bigger insects, and as soon as their mouth is big enough, when they're about an inch, inch and a quarter long, they're eating other fish, including their slow-growing brothers and sisters. Tom Hallowell, still ice on our lakes. Wish I lived where bass are spawning now. I wish you did too, because it's really fun to watch. But you know what? It won't be long. Your ice will be gone, and you'll be having the same stories we're telling. You could be able to do that here in about four or five weeks. Tori Rhodes is asking, does electrofishing this time of year cause any effects to eggs being carried by the female? No, absolutely not. You know, there, there's an old wives' tale that when you electrofish and you shock a female bass, it makes her eggs sterile. Doesn't. That's not the truth because hatcheries 
sometimes it's a common practice to go out and electric fish to gather females to get superior sized fish to come back to the hatcheries to spawn them with males. So no, electric fishing does, does nothing. It uh, has no problem whatsoever. Now, that's not true with trout. Electric fishing is hard on a trout, but it's hard on them physiologically. Not it doesn't just it doesn't necessarily render them sterile, but it can sure fracture their backs, and that can also can happen with channel catfish too. So when we're shocking for catfish, well, we'll turn the juice down just a little bit and just put out enough amperage, you know, four to six amps, just to be able to shock them up without blowing their 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 uh, discs out and their backbones. So no, it doesn't doesn't hurt them at all. It's uh now what hurts them is if you keep them out. You know, now here's another little tip. If you do catch a big female and you want to ooh and all over her and you should and take a picture, do it fast. Don't pick her up by the jaw. Now, if you pick, if you do want to lip her, that's okay, but support her belly with your other hand. Don't hold her like that because if you'll jack, if you jack her jaw and crack it, she will die. She won't be able to eat. She won't be able to move her mouth. She won't be able to breathe right. And it's, it's a shame. You know what? Let me tell you this. This is pretty cool to me. Uh, to this day, I just started my 40th year doing this stuff. To this day, when we shock up a double-digit bass or even a nine and a half, more so for 11 to 13-pound bass, when I see a fish that big, my heart races. I can feel the hair on my neck stand up. And I'm in awe. And I'm in awe not only because of how majestic that fish looks. Yep. Marie Chris Granade. Is that? Yeah, it is. Look at there. It's an Aggie Rain. Class of 1979. And I have a son, class of 2004, and a daughter, class of 2012. So, yes, it is an Aggie Rain. So, anyway, whenever I'm holding a big bass like that, I know. I know the obstacles that it's had to overcome to get to be that big. And those obstacles are astronomical. It's, you know, I, I, yours and my odds of getting struck by electricity are 1 in 17 million. I think the odds of a bass making it to 13 or 14 pounds exceeds that. I bet it's 1 in 30 million if we could figure that out. Gigum class of 91. Love it. I love it. That's great. Good to see you. Glad you're joining us tonight. You know, so whenever I see a big fish like that, I want to give it the honor that it deserves and I want to revel in that moment and then take a couple of pictures, keep it wet. Because another thing you got to remember, I think one thing you got to remember is that a bass that weighs 12, 13 pounds is probably getting to the end of its life. All the more reason to be more gentle with it. Treat it like you treat the first date with the woman that's going to be your wife. That's kind of a weird analogy, Lusk. You know, but that's, that's what I believe. Be gentle with it. Be kind to it. You know, treat it with respect and dignity. Get it back in the water pretty quick. Christopher Aguilar got his first magazine last week. Got a boy. Tell us what you think about it. Top up something nice out there. Put it up there. It's good stuff, man. Thanks for joining in. I I know it's three or four weeks ago when you uh, when you uh, bought in. I, I saw it as I was talking on this show. That's that's good stuff. All right, I'm ready to take a few questions from you guys. Uh, you know, let me think. What else can I talk to you about the bass spawn? You know what? Let's take it a step further. So right now, in some parts of North Texas, the fish are staging. And uh, there's Jason Nipstad. Hey, Jason. See you, buddy. Good to see you, man. Uh, that plant you got that you sent me the picture, that's not eelgrass. I wish it was. Eelgrass blades are much wider. They're almost as thick as a cattail or wide as a cattail weed or uh, leaf. And then they lay kind of, they kind of um, are semi-buoyant under the water. They're good plants. If you can get some of those, man, I'd put them in the lake. So they're, you know, right before they spawn, they're coming up from deep water into shallow water. The males are going to stage first. If you guys watched Major League Fishing three or four weeks ago when they were fishing at Lake Conroe, and the, the guys that were in the lead, that's what they were doing. They were catching buck bass because their you know, Major League Fishing rules are a little different. It weighs a pound or more, it counts. So if you can catch a bunch of them, you can get your numbers up, get your weights up, you should get a better chance at, 
at uh, at winning the tournament. But um, I guess it was, I think it was Edwin Evers maybe that caught a female and just sent him over the top, and that let it, allowed him to win that tournament. Well, that what was going on then is the bass had staged. They were ready to spawn. Then a cold front blew through, sent the females back deeper, and they're just sitting in the water 10 to 12 feet, maybe deeper than that, just keeping back until the temperature's just right. Because if they don't spawn at the right temperature, then the hatch rate goes down. And here's what happens. If you've got eggs in the bottom of the nest and the temperature drops, those eggs don't breathe as well, their metabolism isn't as happening, happening as well, and a fungus will start to grow on those eggs and kill them. So one of nature's insurance policies is to let those fish intuitively and instinctively sense when the temperature is right so they can come up shallow and spawn. Now the males, all males are ready all the time. <laughs> so they're up there, they're, they, got, they, got, they got everything built, it's ready to go. When the girl's ready, she's gonna come. So what was going on pre-spawn is these fish are staging at different times. Now, if you're an angler, it's real important to know that. And then when they do spawn, the girl comes up, lays her eggs, maybe goes to another nest, maybe goes to another nest, and that might last five or six days. And that's it, just during the cycle of a full moon. And then the girl goes back and she starts to feed. So you can catch a big bass during the spawn, and it's okay to do that. Well, then the male sits on the eggs, the eggs hatch, you have the swim up fry coming up, and then they go out and they start moving around in unison in a... Well, I don't know how that happened. So anyway, the, uh, uh, the big cloud of bass will come up and then they'll start to spread out. And by that time, they're an inch, inch and a quarter long. Now they're eating each other. And then they disperse and it's, it's all fish for themselves. Because if you can imagine in a, say a 15 acre lake, there might be 35 spawns going on at the same time. And those first spawns are going to have a distinct advantage over the subsequent spawns because they're going to be able to eat them. So those 50,000 babies, might, so those, those thousands of babies might not end up being just three that make it to eight or 10 inches long. And by the following fall, nine months later, they, they may only be... Uh, three bass out of each spawn that get to be 10 or 11 inches long. More likely it might be two of them that, might, that get to be that big. Tom Hallowell says, I have no stone, just a clay bottom. Does this reduce the hatch rates of largemouth and bluegill? No, it doesn't. As long as the clay bottom is firm and fairly flat, they'll come in and make nests there. You know, now what they'll do is they'll sweep the silt off the clay. Now gravel is better, sand is, is not quite as good, clay isn't quite as good, but they'll still use it they just got to find a flat spot on the windward side and bass are going to spawn at 18 inches to 14 up uh, to four feet deep typically sometimes they'll spawn deeper than that so as long as you got a firm here's the deal they want a firm substrate they'll choose gravel first if you have it if you don't they, then they'll pick sand and if you don't and that's what you got it's clay that's what they'll do you know and so that's how that works Terry Rhodes has asked me in an all-female bass pond, what happens to the eggs? Are they reabsorbed or laid in depressions? No, that's a great question. In the female-only stocked lakes, which there are some of those around, those females will go through the process, but they won't spawn. They'll absorb their eggs. And they'll do that within, the, and, and just to kind of take you to the next step, they'll reabsorb their eggs, and as soon as they do that, they'll start developing eggs for next year. And then that, when the females that do spawn, when they're spent and they've laid their eggs, they start developing eggs for the next year. Their ovaries will shrink, but they'll fill back up with eggs and they'll start right then developing eggs because it takes, oh, you know, 10 months or 11 months for those eggs to develop to maturity to where they can lay them. That's why, you know, it's, it's, I get a common question I get is somebody will catch a bass in, you know, October. And they'll say, hey, my bass are getting ready to spawn. They're full of eggs. Well, they're developing those eggs for the next year. Here's another really interesting tip that you guys will like. I think since these females only spawn in cycles of the full moon and, and the boys, what they'll do is the bigger the female, they spawn first. The big females spawn first, but they won't spill, spend all their eggs because their ovaries are not so vascularated that all their eggs develop at once. 
So the eggs on the outside of the ovaries where, the, where, it's, where there's a good blood flow, those are going to develop first. They'll spawn those. Then the interior eggs will start developing as well. And then they'll spawn those in the next cycle of the full moon. And on a rare occasion, we'll see a third spawn, and which might occur even as late as September, from eggs that were left over. Even while she's developing new eggs for next year, which that sounds kind of crazy, but I've seen it. Not common, but I've seen that. <clears throat> so that's what happens. And then when the male gets through manning the nest, so to speak, then he'll go out and try to feed and be real aggressive and be hanging out with other fish about the same size as he is. And you, you'll be catching those males in May, June, July because they're hungry. You know, so that's kind of how that whole cycle works. Let's see, Billy Bates, he's got it. Everybody, don't forget, hashtag Pond Boss Magazine. Click like and share this video to your timeline. Right now, you'll be eligible for a drawing for a Pond Boss hat and a Pond Boss mug. We'll do that drawing next week. Let's see, so Brian Merriweather says, Will hybrid bluegill shut down the spawning activities for the crowd control bass? Um, let me make sure I understand your question. Will hybrid bluegill shut down the spawning activities for the crowd control bass. I'm not sure what you mean by crowd control bass. So so what, I see David Reich's checking in. Um, I may interpret your question wrong. If so, be a little more specific. But what, what I think I'm reading is that there's some males that don't have their own nest, like a young buck will come in and want to try to spawn. Will hybrid bluegill shut down the spawning activities for the crowd? Not really. Hybrid bluegill, now what they will do, here's what will happen, is if there's a male guarding the nest and a hybrid bluegill comes in from over here, he'll chase it off. And when he does, there might be three or four more hybrid bluegill. And bluegill will do this. will come right back in and sneak in and eat some eggs while he's away from the nest, defending the nest against those sunfish. So if the sunfish are a little crowded, they can affect the spawn. Jason Nipstad, if I catch a male and a female spawning and push the eggs into a large aquarium, followed by squeezing the male's sperm on top of them, do you think they would hatch? I think they would hatch if if you've got just the right flow rate going on in the, in the gravel. But if they get sucked into the gravel, into the gra if, you, if you've got, uh, if your airlift system in your aquarium isn't working, if it's sucking too much water through the gravel, it'll suck the eggs in there and kill the eggs. But it's not unusual in fish hatcheries for technicians to collect the female's eggs, use the milk. Now, this is kind of cool. You, you probably never heard this. The, the old school way is to take the eggs into a jar with some water in it, squirt the milk in it, and take a feather. No kidding. Believe me. I didn't believe it when I first saw it, but to this day, the old, the old head fish squeezers will take a feather and mix the milk with the eggs and then they hatch them in what's called a McDonald jar, which is a neutral buoyancy flow of oxygenated water. And when the eggs hatch, the babies spill over, go into a trough, and they collect. But to answer your question, can you spawn them in an aquarium? Yeah, you can, but what you're going to have a hard time doing is getting them to eat. So once they hatch and turn into swim-up fry, you got about two hours to get them out of there to where they can have some food, live food. Which you, now, Jason, I know you. You can go get some krill. You can go get you can you can figure out if you want to hatch some uh, uh, some brine shrimp, they'll eat the heck out of those, and you're, you're the kind of guy that would do that. But if you want to hatch them in an aquarium, you can do it, but you got to you got to mimic what nature does. And if you don't know how to do that, it ain't gonna work. All right, let's see. Drew Hayes said, "I wanted to ask you on a two third acre, how much Aquamax should you feed, especially if I try the tigers up here." I presume you're talking about tiger bass. Well, here's here's my story about that, Drew. There's John Wilson. Hey, John, good to see you, man. Baseball season. Hey, it's baseball season. You're ready for that. The uh, Tell me how Cleveland's looking, man. They ought to have a pretty good year. I've been hearing some good things on the news. So, um, Drew, the amount of Aquamax you should feed is going to be a, what your fish will clean up in about five minutes. So if you're feeding Aquamax... Whatever they'll eat in five minutes, that's enough. Now, if they don't eat it all, don't feed so much. If they eat it in about 30 seconds, feed a little bit more. That's what I would do. Here's my daughter, Lindsay. Help, uh, hey, Lindsay, tell Gentry that I didn't take her call a while ago because I'm doing this show, but I'll see her in a minute. 
All right, so now let's see uh, let's see what we got here. Benjamin Johnson. I live in Ohio and I have a one-acre pond that I'm trying to develop. There are tons of 12-inch bass, but I'm worried there isn't enough food for them to pack on the pounds. What would you recommend? Harvest some bass. In a one-acre pond, what I would do there is you want to keep the best of the best and females. So if you catch some fish that have rotund bellies, they know how to play the game. Put them back. But when you're catching some bass whose relative weights are under 95 or even 90, start culling some of those bass. In a one-acre pond, depending on how long the bass have been crowded, you know, in a one-acre pond, a typical 12-inch bass might be four years old. So if you can be culling some of those bass to get some faster-growing young ones coming up behind them, then you've got a better chance of growing some more some big bass. Now, if your food chain has been depleted, you need to replenish it. And in Ohio, you're right on the cusp where bluegill can be a nuisance, but they're still the backbone of the food chain. I would kind of lean more toward pumpkin seeds. And, uh, um, oh, there's a, uh, there's a minnow there that thrives. It's not, it's escaping me right now. But that's, but that's what I would do. I'd start culling some bass, but I would weigh them and measure them. If, if you guys want, I've got a, 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 a an Excel spreadsheet where you can plug in your links and weights of bass, and it will tell you how overweight, underweight, or how, how they are. And you can judge that. If you want that, just send me an email at bobblusk at outlook.com. I'll send you that spreadsheet, and then you can track your bass. But weigh and measure some. You're going to find out that some of your bass just aren't growing like they should be. That's the ones to call. And a one-acre pond in Ohio, I'm going to tell you, uh, if you call 20 to 30 bass, you should, you should start seeing a difference. Now, because when you pull some mouths away from the trough and you got and you're farming some bait fish, you're gonna start to see the weights go up. But if you don't have the bait fish, you need to stock some. Stock some adult bluegills and maybe some pumpkin seeds. Find a local hatchery that'll sell you those things. Zach J. Russell, if trying the aquarium spawning, how would you incorporate feed so one could feed train the little guys? I'd start with krill and uh um oh brine shrimp. I'd be timing it where some brine shrimp are being hatched every every you know few hours, twice a day, and I'd be using those because they're they're not going to train on fish food. Ain't going to happen. But what will happen is if you can feed them some frozen krill and some live brine shrimp and get them accustomed to coming to you, then you can take some krill, some frozen krill, and start mixing it with like some of the Aquamax uh, Purina starter feeds. They're 60% protein, and you start mixing some krill with that feed into a paste and feed them some of that. And once, now here's the deal if you have a 100 bass hatch, about 40 of them or 50 of them might feed train. And you're going to end up with water quality issues, so be prepared for that. You're going to have to exchange some water at some point. So um, that's what I would do. Let's see here. Eric Avery from Soggy, Nebraska. Oh my gosh, you guys are getting hammered. You guys are getting hammered over there. Zach's talking about the Smart Fish app. Hey, you know what? I don't talk about that enough. Uh, for you, you guys that watch this show regularly, I had Wade Bales on with me when we were in Memphis at the SLMP meeting here back in January. He's developed the Smart Fish app. You guys need to get that because you can plot your links and weights into the Smart Fish app and it will immediately tell you the relative weight of your fish. I'm glad you brought that up, Zach. Thank you for reminding me because that's what you should do. The app is free. Now, if you want them to store the data, it's $65 a year. That's pretty dead gum cheap for what you get out of that, especially if you're, if you're real serious about managing your fishery and trying to figure out, you know, if you should be culling fish or not. That's a great app. Let's see. Clint Loveday, we stocked fingerlings in March 15, March, on March 15, 2018. Last week, I caught 30-plus bluegill over 8 inches long and weighing 9.5 to 10 ounces. Dad gum, that's really good growth. Thanks, Bob. It wouldn't have been possible without your help. Purina's MVP and Texas Hunter Feeders. You know what? Thank you for that. I'm so glad you're telling people that because that's what happens. If you've got a good feeding program, you're consistent with it, you're paying attention to your fish feeding, that's what you get. You know, so I'm, I'm proud to hear you say that. And I'm also proud to endorse Purina's Aquamax products. You know, the thing I love about Purina is they developed a line of products for everybody that wants to just feed fish for fun. 
or to grow the biggest bluegill on the planet or feed train bass or whatever. They do a great job. And Texas Hunter, they've got the very best feeders on the market today and the best customer service. So I'm really glad that, that, that they're a part of us and I'm a part of them. And I appreciate them helping sponsor this show. All right, let's see. Christopher Aguilar, sorry I'm fishing and listening. Oh, you dog. You know, don't, hey, don't come up here big dogging us, man. You're reading the magazine. You're sitting in your living room chair. Oh, wait, I'm looking outside. The sun's still shining. Okay, well, good. I'm glad, you, I'm glad you're fishing, reading Pond Boss, watching this show. Uh, post a picture on here in a minute with a big fish you're catching. <laughs> I'm glad you're doing that, man. The magazine is great, he says. Love it. I can read each article and let it sink in and read another later. Well, you know what? I write the thing for the most part uh, or edit it, and I can read it let it sink in and read it again. And I just love it that much. Okay, uh, hit me with some more questions. Let me think about some other things about spawning bass because I didn't, I didn't think about all this. I was just told what my topic was going to be. So let me think about it a minute. All right, so we've gone through all the stages of spawning. Oh, post-spawn. That's when guys love to fish because the fish are going to bite better because they're hungry. Because you know, if you think about it, when fish are spawning, bass are spawning, and that's what their focus is, well, they're not gaining weight, they're losing weight because they're expending energy. They're expending energy laying eggs. They, they spent energy to develop the eggs. They're spending energy to, to, to um, guard the nest. You know, So when they come off those beds after a full moon cycle, they're hungry, and they're going to go out and eat, and they're going to prepare, and they're going to stage again for the next cycle of the spawn. So it's not unusual, especially in southern states, to see a spawn in March, then another one in April, and in some cases, depending on the weather and the temperatures, sometimes it'll carry over into full moon phases in May. You know, now for you folks in the Midwest, your first spawn of bass is probably going to be the next full moon cycle in April, then another one in May, and as we go further north, it gets pushed back even a little further. Now here's something that's real interesting. Bluegill, they're totally different. They're colony spawners. They spawn about every, I'm going to say, 45 to 60 days. And they're spawning in cycles of the full moon. But they're spawning in warmer temperatures than bass do, typically. Now, it's not unusual in the south to see a, see a bluegill spawn, a small bluegill spawn during the uh, bluebird days, even in January or February, when the temperature in Texas, for example, gets up in the 80s for three or four days. Nope, some bluegill will shoot up, go into the beds, and they'll have babies. You know, the 14-acre lake we shocked last Friday, we shocked it in November. Actually, yeah, late October of 2018, we didn't see hardly any baby bluegills. And then Friday, we saw thousands of bluegill that weren't even an inch long yet, which was pretty interesting to me. That tells me that there was enough warm days and that lake is shallow enough, the temperature went up, and they had babies either in January or February because we were looking at them in March. Jason says, is there anything we can do to promote bluegill spawning on the giant gravel beds? Zach and I broke our backs building. Let's see here. Um, my fear is that we did all that work for nothing. Yeah, you can start feeding some bluegill around there and then be sure you have bluegill. If you've got spawning beds in McFadden Lake, they're going to find it. Now, it, it may not be until you have a bunch of bluegill that are five or six inches long. Because those little bitty bluegills like you guys have that are four inches long, they don't have to come to the gravel. They've already got their places figured out. But as their babies start to grow up, they're going to be looking for new places to spawn. And the gravel beds that you built are great for that. I see Chris Jobs joining in. Hey, Chris. Eric Avery, when you graph your relative weight, do you break it into different seasons? Yeah, you know what? I like to keep track of the dates. Because I do like to compare pre-spawn, post-spawn, middle of summer, fall. So I would keep track of the dates and I would even keep separate graphs. I'm not smart enough to know how to take that Excel spreadsheet and change the color based on the date. I don't know how to do that. But for you guys that do, you can do it that way as well. And that way you get a good comparison. Let's see. Uh, Jason says we built them next to the feeders. Good. I think that's a good idea. Let's see. Let me go back and make sure I got Eric's question. I stopped post on late summer to keep accurate records. Well, here's the, here's the reason that relative weights over a long period of time is important is because you can begin to see the trends as they happen. Instead of doing it, you know, once a year or twice a year and then you're being reactive, 
If you're tracking relative weights ongoing, you can begin to see some trends where fish growth is leveling off. And at that point, you can start doing your culling. So that's a reason, to, that's a perfect reason right there to keep it going. So let's see here. Tom Hallowell, one of my ponds I was trying, smallmouth pumpkin seeds and yellow perch. Added shiners early on. The smallmouth are not keeping up predation. Yellow, yellow perch are thin and small and shiners are out of control and large. Going to add largemouth this spring. Any suggestions? Yeah, don't do it. If you're going to, if you're, if you're going to add largemouth bass, do single sex. If, if, if the yellow perch aren't gaining weight, the smallmouth bass aren't gaining control pred, uh, as a predator. I, you know what? You didn't say how big that pond is, but I'd be tempted to put a few tiger muskies in it. You know, now I wouldn't put more than two or three per acre and because that way you can harvest them and they're not going to reproduce. They can help you cull and they do a great job of it. But if you want to use largemouth bass, either go get one female or two or three males or something like that. Don't go get both sexes because you're going to trade problems because in a pond in the north, the bluegill are going to, I mean, the uh, largemouth bass are going to dominate and then everything's going to quit growing in a northern pond. Mitchell Morton checking in from North Kakalak. Let's see, Zach Russell says, should we feed over the beds during the bluegill spawn or more off of the side? You know, I'd feed off to the side because while they're spawning, you want them to be focused on that. You don't want a bunch of invaders coming in to eat fish food because here's what's going to happen. When your bluegill are spawning, those spawning bluegill are keeping all the other fish at bay. And if you invite the other fish in, it causes an issue. So I would not do that. I'd feed them off to the side. Now, the reason to feed bluegills close to a bed is so that you can bring more bluegills into that area for the next spawn. Because what will happen is the fish that dominate the nest have to be bigger than the ones that are on the nest now. And the only way that can happen is if they're getting big and they know about it. So that's why I like to feed adjacent to a bed, but not right over one. Let's see here. Holy cow, we got some more stuff coming in. Tom Hallowell, three-quarter acre. You know what? I would put in, Tom, I would be tempted to put in maybe two male bass that are 14 inches long. And I think I'd go get a couple of tiger muskies if you could. That's what I would do. And then see which ones work, because you can sure catch those bass out if you largemouth bass. Okay, Rudy Billings says I put two pounds of minnows, a couple dozen bluegill shell crackers, and six catfish in the pond. They did not seem to have any life other than frogs and turtles. I also put a feeder the same day to feed twice a day. Came back a week later and threw some catfish food, expecting to see activity like my other pond. Nothing. Are they gone or hiding really well? It's been a year and I still don't see any activity. I haven't had time to fish. Well, if you're feeding twice a day and they're not coming in within about two to three weeks, something's wrong. The fish might have been not might not have been handled well, or there's a bunch of things I can't play ifs and buts on this one. But if they're not feeding after a year, something's going on. Either you got an alligator or something's chewing up your fish, or they died when you put them in. Eric Avery, thanks, Bob. Great magazine. Thanks a lot, man. There's David Schneiderman. Hey, buddy. He's our easy dock friend. If you guys are looking for a floating dock, click on David Schneiderman's Facebook page here, and he's going to tell you all about those. And, and matter of fact, I think he reps for several dock companies. If you need a dock, here's your guy right here. He's just checking in. I have, I've had a Texas Hunter feeder feeding MVP since August. Nothing comes to the feeder except turtles. I cleared out many of the turtles. Stocked 3,500 copper-nosed bluegill last month in a three-and-a-half-acre farm pond in Medill. Still no feeder action. Is the feeder at the wrong place? No, it's not. Uh, what's going on is the water's still cool. Your water temperature right now is just on the cusp where bluegill are going to start getting active. So keep the feeder going, and you'll start to see a little bit of activity. Then you'll come back the next time you see a little bit more, and before long, you'll see them blowing up. Now, what I wouldn't do is I wouldn't be pitching out a huge amount of feed I set that feeder to go off, take this hunter feeder for maybe two seconds. That'll be enough feed to where the fish, it actually, one of the things I like about uh, Aquamax MVP is it's got an odor, a fishy smell. And so I would, I would keep feeding, just cut the feed back. And then once they start to eat it, then start ramping it up. I hope you bought those fish from my guys. Sheridan Ashmore, good evening, Bob. Jason Nipstad, we're stocking bluegill at our feeders. Get them fat and full of eggs as fast as possible. That's good. 
And here comes Christopher Aguilar. Just caught a bluegill. Oh, yeah. Where's the picture? <laughs> All right, guys. I think that's going to about wrap us up. It's uh, 725 I've hit all the highlights and everything I can think about about spawning bass this time of year. You know, I was looking at a picture the other day of my grandson, Ethan. When he turned 13, he is uh, knocking on the door of his 20th birthday now. But when he had, had his 13th birthday, he called me up about a month in advance. And he said, hey, Papa, can I bring a bunch of my friends out and go fishing? And said, yep, you sure can. Bring some adults. So, uh, uh, he brought, I think, six of his buddies out. Not one of those kids except Ethan had ever caught a fish. So I took them down. We got a catfish pond. I let each one of those boys catch a fish. And I was looking at that picture of those kids. There was a redheaded boy kind of chunky holding a bass. I mean, holding a big catfish like he wanted to marry it. There were two kids trying to figure out how to pick their fish up. There were two more looking over in the tub thinking, I don't know if I want to do that or not. One little boy, the last one to catch one, holding it about this big. We took him over. I got a little fish cleaning station. I taught him how to clean the catfish. And getting, we cleaned the biggest one first because that was the hardest one for him to learn about. I snapped the head off, put the head over there, and she, a flock of boys went away from where we were cleaning the fish. They got skinning pliers and paring knives and fillet knives. They started digging down into that Uh fish's head trying to get the brain out and the eyes and then once we finished cleaning the fish i helped them fillet the biggest ones then we took them over to our outdoor kitchen and they cooked fish and served it to everybody so they got to go catch their first fish clean them cook them and feed everybody well i see those kids from time to time and every time i see them they say something ethan now is 20 knocking on the door 20 He's in the Air Force. He's studying to be a remote sensor operator for drones. And I called him a few days ago, and, and we were talking about that. He said, hey, Papa, do you remember when we had that party out there? He remembers it to this day. So if you get a chance to take some kids fishing this spring and this summer, please do that. Get them involved. we got to have more kids in the outdoors. So uh, rock and roll. I am so glad you're here. And hey, well, I don't know what we're going to do next Wednesday, but we're going to do something fun. So I appreciate you tuning in. Pond Boss Magazine, $35 a year. Buy one. Keep this thing rolling. We appreciate it, and we will see you next Wednesday. Adios.